Can I just add my very warm words of welcome to everyone here? It's great to see such a, such a large crowd, expectant for, for an exciting day. Uh, and again, to keep us on track, um, we're going to have uh, talks of 30 minutes. There'll be 15 minutes for questions, answers. There'll be roving mics um, to make sure that everybody can hear. It's all caught on, on video for this. Um, and a little bit of time between talks um, just to make sure that we can get the AV set up. And so, in order to keep to that schedule, I'd like to begin by introducing Professor Helga Krag from the Niels Bohr Institute in uh, Copenhagen, who will be speaking to us on big physics before and after the Manhattan Project. Helga. Let me start with saying a few words about the concept of big science or big physics, which is not a well-defined concept, except that it refers to scientific, sorry, to a scientific project which of course are extremely expensive, which requires a uh, large staff of uh, scientists and technicians, and which is often, but not always, based on a particular kind of very complicated uh, machine. Uh, it's also a concept which is associated with post-World War II and physics and, astro and, and astronomy in, in particular, but I would like to emphasize that it's not by itself a, a modern concept. It can be found way back in history, and I'll give a couple of, of examples. Uh, the first one uh, being one of the most remarkable and most successful examples of big science ever. Uh, as you probably know, uh, we have this Venus transit over the, over the Sun, a rare astronomical phenomenon, and it was started in great detail in these two transit years, 61 and 69, in, an, in a huge international project, uh, including more than 100 observations all over the globe. But this evidently is a kind of big science project which is very, very different from those projects which are um, centered on a particular machine at a particular place. Uh, this was not really a high-tech high project because the telescopes that people used to study the, tr the transit were uh, quite common telescopes, they were not advanced in any way, and yet this project was very important. People managed to find uh, the so-called astronomical unit, which is the average distance from the Sun to the Earth, and get a very uh, good uh, value for it, about 150 million uh, kilometers, and that was the whole purpose of this project. Uh, so let me contrast this with another project from the very same period, the Enlightenment period, uh, the, uh, again, very remarkable apparatus, uh, the electrostatic generator, we we'll call it today, uh, which a Dutch uh, natural philosopher by the name Martinus van Marum constructed for the Tyler Museum in uh, Harlem, the Netherlands. And uh, this is certainly big, uh, a big, big science they produced uh, sparks of the length almost one meter, which probably corresponds to an energy or a voltage of uh, between one half and one million volts. Uh, so the, here we have a big machine, but uh, its purpose was not really scientific. It was much more a showcase, a demonstration, a marvel. And it didn't produce, as far as I know, uh, any worthwhile scientific results. That, however, was the case with my uh, next example, which is from the mid-19th century, and many of you will undoubtedly know about it or have heard about it. This is a big machine, or a big telescope. It dates from the 1840s, and uh, interestingly, and Contrary to modern uh, big science projects, this was privately funded. No government money involved at all. Uh, the builder of it was uh, Parsons, uh, uh, better known as the Earl of Ross, uh, 
He built it on his estate in Ireland, and it was a, uh, a mirror telescope, uh, which uh, evidently was extremely costly. But it turned out that in this case, the money was well, well, well spent. Because with this monster telescope, uh, the Earl of Ross discovered uh, the first spiral uh, nebulae, or galaxies, as we call them today, and uh, made the first studies of them. This is uh, one of these drawings made at the time, and it corresponds very nicely to modern photographs of this particular nebula. Um, my last example is from the early 20th century. My first old example, so to speak, is from the early uh, 20th century, and is again of a different type. Um, this again is from the Netherlands. Uh, it's a famous laboratory built by Heike Kamerling Onnes, the Dutch uh, physicist who received the Nobel Prize. And um, again, it, it was uh, built around uh, very advanced cryogenic uh, machines which could produce uh, extreme cold. That was the whole idea of it. Um, but it was not a particular machine. It was more the, the organization of the whole laboratory, which was very large and required uh, uh, technicians were as important for the success of this laboratory as much as the academic scientists. Here on the picture to the right, uh, that is from 1908, and we have, uh, sorry, we have <coughs> Carolyn Honors here with his assistant, uh, very advanced machinery at the time. This is 20 years later. Honors has grown older. Of course he had. Um, and his, that is from a memorial meeting at the laboratory. Uh, it, these persons are all very well-known physicists from this period. Uh, here we have Paul Ehrenfest, the Dutch physicist, his compatriot, the age, aging um, Hendrik Lorenz, and this is Niels Bohr. This laboratory was the only one in the world which could produce these extremely low uh, temperatures which were needed to liquefy helium. That happened in that laboratory in 1908. Three years later, uh, Onnes used this uh, discovery to produce, to uh, announced the discovery of superconductivity, and some years later, superfluidity was discovered in the very same laboratory. So it was uh, very, very important. And, uh, but let me now go to the, well, not exactly the modern era, but at least uh, the kind of uh, big science which can be associated with modern big science especially in high-energy physics. High-energy physics, uh, in a certain sense at least, uh, came into being in the early 1930s. It's a matter of definition, of course, but um, in the early 1930s we have nuclear physics. And people at the time were typically referring to nuclear physics uh, rather than high-energy physics. But it was basically the same, and um, um, not only did people understand the atomic nucleus fairly well at the time, after the discovery of the neutron and things like that, uh, but um, they were also able to, for the first time ever, to make experiments with the atomic nucleus. Uh, and to do that, you needed high uh, energies, so you could accelerate alpha particles and protons and other particles. There were not so many particles at the time, so it was a little easier then. Uh, and uh, the master constructor and designer of, um, of um, the new kind of accelerators was, of course, Ernest Lawrence in California. But there were, he was not the first. We have Cockcross and Walton in England, for instance, and there were other people, Van de Graaff and so on. But there's no doubt that the cyclotron uh, established a new kind of physics, of experimental physics. Uh, this is 
Laura is this, that is second generation of his famous cyclotron. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work. Um, and uh, this is, of course, to illustrate the march towards uh, ever more expensive and ever bigger apparatus. This is uh, 46, uh, and that is, and notice also, I don't know how big uh, Lawrence's group were, was at the time, but probably eight to ten people or so, which has multiplied to a very large number of people and to a huge apparatus. The cyclotron and the technology and the, the mastering of this machine was very much an American or even more a Californian specialty. It was only in California around Lawrence's group that people could uh, build such a thing and could understand what which come out of it. But it was imported to Europe, also to Russia and also to Japan and there were, I don't know, maybe five uh, cyclotrons at the, t at the outbreak of World War II. And that leads me to uh, this um, most important, I don't know what we shall call it, event, uh, namely the Manhattan Project, uh, which is sometimes called a, a big science project. I think that's a misnomer because uh, the aim of the Manhattan Project evidently was not to produce new and interesting science. It was exclusively a military and a political problem, uh, a project, but to succeed with this project, uh, physics and, and some other sciences uh, intervened crucially. And uh, so in any case, Man the Manhattan Project was huge by any standards. Uh, it has been estimated that the total project um, um, cost about two million US dollars at the time, and this amount of money can be translated into modern money to approximately 25 billion dollars. Still today, a decent sum of money. Um, but uh, the Manhattan Project was, of course, divided in many, many sub-projects. Um, the most um, expensive, uh, the biggest in a sense of these projects were the, these two we've, which we have here, which are both concerned with the separation of the two uranium isotopes, 235 and 238, uh, in two different ways, diffusion and electromagnetic separation. Uh, but there were many other projects, uh, and the Manhattan Project there was not one particular site for the Manhattan Project because it was deliberately spread out over the entire country, almost. Uh, here we have the most important of the sites, that is the theoretical group in Los Alamos, which didn't cost a lot of money, but uh, some of the other facilities did absolutely. And this is this huge uh, diffusion plant for, uh, for uranium. Uh, separation. So, uh, so uh, the well, the important thing about the Manhattan Project is evidently that it did result in a nuclear bomb. The first one over Hiroshima, uh, 6 of August 1945, which was a uranium bomb, and then the next one over Nagasaki, which was a uh, plutonium bomb. Uh, so the Manhattan Project uh, set new standards for physics generally and for high f energy physics in particular after World War I for these nations which could afford it. That was primarily uh, the United States uh, which uh, completely dominated high experimental high energy physics uh, for a decade or two. Uh, then eventually uh, uh, Europe ca caught up, but it took quite a lot of time, but uh, from about the mid-1980s, I would say, uh, high energy physics, and that in this respect it means CERN, uh, had more or less taken over, and that is still the situation today. But here we have some of the uh, uh, accelerators at the time. These are all proton accelerators, 
There were also electron accelerators, but that's a different kind of construction. What you should notice, of course, is the beam energy, GeV meaning billion of electron volts, 1,000 million, and it has uh, multiplied with a factor of more than 1,000 in this period alone. Um, a, uh, the, the American and also the European story of experimental high energy physics has been very well described in the historical literature. Uh, unfortunately, the Russian or the Soviet part of it has not received the same kind of attention, of, of, of attention uh, for other reasons, I guess, because uh, it's difficult to get access to um, to the uh, Russian archives, and then, of course, they are written in a strange language, the sources. Uh, but um, the Soviet, the, the Russians did take out the challenge, which was very much part of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, so I would like to, to mention uh, the uh, very large and very advanced Dupne facility which was a kind of science city, is a kind of science city outside Moscow, where in the 1950s there was established what was called the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research. Uh, the first director of which was Georgo Flirov, an eminent nuclear physicist. And uh, uh, this laboratory, it didn't quite match the big American uh, facilities, or for that matter, CERN, but it was very strong in one particular area, um, which is not high energy, maybe, but medium energy, namely uh, the collision between heavy ions. And uh, in such uh, collisions between heavy ions, uh, one can produce uh, artificial elements, so-called super heavy elements, which uh, is a name for artificial elements with an atomic number larger than 110 or so, and the Russians were very successful in this area. Uh, so, uh, reasonably enough, one of these uh, artificial elements uh, which was discovered uh, in this laboratory was named Flerovium. After Flerov, and uh, that is number 114 in the, uh, in the periodic table. Um, yes. Uh, I would also like to mention as a typical example of these uh, huge and powerful uh, accelerators of the classical type, so to speak, um, uh, which was called the Beavertron. Uh, again, uh, a Californian uh, instrument uh, of the uh, LBNL, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, and here we have the staff, or some parts of the staff, I guess. Um, it's interesting because this machine could accelerate protons up to an energy of 6 GeV, uh, which is a very high energy, or was at the time. And uh, uh, the machine was in part designed and built for a particular instrument, uh, for a particular experiment, uh, namely to produce out of that energy uh, pairs of protons and uh, antiprotons. And uh, that succeeded almost immediately. At that time, physicists knew well enough that, of course, antiprotons exist because they believed in Dirac's old theory of antiparticles, but until that time, the only antiparticle known was the anti-electron, called the positron, and there was no uh, direct experimental proof of the existence of antinucleons. But they came with this machine, not only the antiproton, which today is a kind of particle which is produced routinely and in huge numbers in CERN, uh, but also the anti-neutron, which was discovered in the similar experiments shortly thereafter, and it did result in yet another Nobel Prize to these high-energy physicists. Um, 
Oh, yes. Now, uh, to do uh, experimental high energy physics, in, evidently one needs to have uh, a lot of energy, which means that one has to have an accelerator, which can accelerate these charged particles up to enormous speeds. But um, um, an accelerator by itself is worthless if you don't have another machine which can detect the new particles and by means of which you can study these events and what really happened. So uh, detector technology goes hand in hand with accelerator technology and that has always been the case. And uh, today uh, detector technologies are enormous. I mean these uh, machines by means one by means of which one uh, detects and analyzes what happens in these events. They are no less big, no less technologically advanced than the um, accelerators. And that has been a historical process which is quite remarkable. So again, I would like to contrast uh, two kind of detectors. Uh, the first detector, uh, it has this size, maybe. It could be used by almost everyone. You didn't need to have high, highly specialized knowledge. Uh, this is the famous, I don't know if it's famous any longer, but uh, uh, it certainly was at the time, the cloud chamber invented by Charles Wilson in the 1910s and uh, used by your Rutherford and his group, for instance, and many other people. And uh, this uh, simple instrument produced uh, a lot of interesting and good sites. It was a very, very good uh, uh, instrument. It was used not so much in connection with accelerators, be because in the 1920s there were no accelerators, but fortunately enough, uh, there was a heavenly accelerator, so to speak, in the form of cosmic radiation, and uh, which was studied extensively in the years around 1930. And the energy from the cosmic radiation, cosmic rays, I mean, are uh, extremely energetic. Actually, of higher energy than anything which can be produced on Earth, as far as I know. But that changed. And um, by, well, by the late or mid-1930s, uh, Cloud chambers were not used, they were not used uh, very much at least in connection with cyclotrons and uh, people needed a new kind of, uh, of um, uh, detector and in the post-World War period, roughly between 55 and 85 maybe, uh, the successor, the, the favorite successor detector was the, uh, not the, uh, the, the bubble chamber which was invented by an American physicist by the name Donald Glaser. And uh, that, uh, again, the, the, the first bubble chamber was, was quite simple, uh, but it was developed into a monster of a complicated machine uh, in uh, California. And the people at the time, they, they used this vocabulary, spoke of, spoke of it as an aristocratic or an undemocratic instrument for the simple reason that it couldn't be understood, it couldn't be managed uh, by everyone. In fact, it could only be understood and managed by the Californian teams. Um, so, um, yes. Uh, in this period, uh, I mean, after my talk, there'll be a lot of, uh, you will get a lot of information about more uh, recent and very modern, uh, both high energy physics and, uh, and uh, big science uh, in a connection with astronomy. Uh, but in the period of which I have spoken, perhaps the, the most important uh, result of the post-World War II development in big science, or big physics at least, was a change, a mental change, in the minds of the physicists. The big machines uh, made physicists think differently. 
uh, they, they, uh, their relationship between machine and man changed drastically. And the relationship between the individual scientist and the large team of scientists of which he or she was a member changed too. Um, I have an example of that from an early date in accelerator physics, which I think is fairly, well, I think it's remarkable. I even think that it's shocking. Um, that is, now, in, in 1956 or thereabout, uh, the Brookhaven National Laboratory had, decide, had, had a, got ready a large uh, proton accelerator, which they called the Cosmotron. And uh, the leader of the laboratory at that time was uh, Samuel Gautschmidt, a Dutch-American physicist who became a leader of US physics, but is probably best known as one of the inventors back in 1920, not inventors, one of the discoverers back in 1925 of the electron spin. Hugely important uh, discovery for which he and his co-discoverer, strangely enough, never received a Nobel Prize. But that's another thing. In 1956, when uh, Gauschmidt was uh, director of this laboratory, he sent a memorandum to the scientific staff. And uh, this memorandum goes as follows. I think it's worth to, to uh, read it aloud, some parts of it. I shall reserve the right to refuse experimental work in high energy to any member of my staff whom I deem unfit for group collaboration. I must remind you that it is, after all, not you, but the machine that creates the particles and events which you investigate with such great seal. So, so there clearly is a, a change in view of um, who decides, so to speak. Is it machine or is it you? I'm sure that Charlie Chaplin would have loved that. And uh, well, I think we'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helgo, for, for starting us off with this large historical uh, uh, overview, but also bringing things up to mm. some striking, striking questions that we might have. And I'm, I'm sure there will be plenty of questions. We, we do have time. Uh, perhaps I, I can just take my chair's privilege as you're gathering your thoughts there. And just to say, you've ended with this thing which might seem an, an ethical dilemma, mm -hmm. uh, a challenge to the conventions of uh, collaboration. But did uh, Gutsmit say anything about what might make you unfit for group collaboration? Was yeah. he actually trying to make it a clear sense that this was a collaborative endeavour and he was trying to Yes, enshrine? Yes, he did. Uh, this, of course, what I have presented here is only part of this memorandum. And uh, he, he does spell out what he means by collaborative spirit. And his, uh, uh, it did create uh, some uh, bad feelings among the, the physicists, naturally. Um, but uh, apparently, ha he had in mind that the the uh, the individual, the genius, m maybe who may might conceive himself or herself as a genius, had no place in this kind of laboratory. They could do their work if they wanted to, but not in my. Okay. Laboratory. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So I can see straight away a question down here in the second row. Thank you. Uh, how did, particularly before the Second World War, how did people like Lawrence and Lawrence and people get the money? How did they sell it to folk who could fund it, like the government or whoever or whatever? whoever? Uh, I must admit that I, I, I can't remember uh, how his machine originally was funded, although I'm, I'm, I, well, th that was u u university money. And uh, uh, Lawrence had very good connections to other Californian scientists who also had very good connection to industrialists 
and the donators. So it was uh, in, in the pre-war period, 1930, it was uh, mostly or completely, I'm not sure, but a, a private money. Uh, I mean, the, the, yes, and the, I mean, there, there was uh, in the US and especially in California a long tradition for that. For that. Um, uh, he and his group, they appealed to the same sponsors which also were responsible for the large telescopes uh, which was built in the same place. It's also worth noticing that Lawrence was a great salesman. Yes, I thought so. I thought it had to be. The next question over here. I'm aware that uh, uh, since 1960s, uh, uh, man-machine interface became uh, topical in system science. Is this uh, deceiving uh, for system science, or they are uh, not related? There may be some relation, but but I can't figure out how. But but uh, of course, this kind of uh, relationship uh, has grown even more. Um, even more uh, marked, in a sense, uh, and, and especially, you, you know, uh, a typical paper in experimental high energy physics at the time uh, had maybe uh, five to ten authors. And uh, as, as we know from bibliometric analysis, this number of co-authors has grown uh, with r rapidly, there, there, some of you may know that there was, well, just uh, five years ago or so, uh, there was set a world record, which probably never will be beaten. Uh, namely, there was published an, uh, an experimental paper from CERN. It has something to do with the measurement of, uh, of the Higgs boson's mass. And uh, the number of authors was about 5,000. And all these authors were mentioned, of course. The paper itself it, uh, was about uh, 20 pages, and the first 17 pages <laughs> were <laughs> very small things on the authors of the authority. So next over here. Hi, thank you for the great lecture. I'm interested in the interface of big science and ethics. And, and, and you know, this is a well-defined problem now, but at the time, um, I understand from my own um, uh, research that during the Manhattan Project there was um, an anxiety amongst the scientists that um, a nuclear explosion can ignite the atmosphere and, and, and lots of other um, considerations like that and yet they decided to proceed. Um, can you offer any insight about what were the structures, the governance and sort of ethical structures that um, made the decision, both during the Manhattan Project and after, during the 50s and the 60s, um, if there were any um, ethical considerations about, you know, the risks associated with the experiments, what were the governance structures and what were the ethical considerations uh, around it? Uh, oh yes, uh, I mean, uh, this is a, a topic which has been um, uh, analyzed in great detail by, by historians and, and uh, philosophers of science. So, and it, it's well known that, that uh, many of the scientists uh, in, in Alamogorda and elsewhere, uh, they had these ethical uh, problems. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, uh, the situation was so uh, different from any other situations, and be, because they had their eyes on the atrocities in in Europe uh, and also in Japan and so forth. So uh, under the circumstances, most of these um, uh, the, these uh, ethical uh, problems they, they were overruled by the uh, necessity of the and uh, even in July 1945, after the first when the first bomb was uh, exploded in in the uh, New Mexico desert. I mean, there, were, there was a long discussion. Of, now we have demonstrated that we have the bomb, and uh, but should we also use it? 
against the Japanese. Uh, the bomb, of course, was originally the bomb project was the bomb was originally aimed at the Germans, but the Germans had capitulated at that time, and there was this uh, discussion. Many of the scientists said we should uh, make a demonstration at some uninhabited island and not use it against civilians and, and soldiers. But of course, at that time, the decision was the militaries and not the scientists. Yes, thank you. Um, in fact, a related question to the lady over there. Um, but just um, winding back a bit, uh, I'm curious about the, the genesis of the military aspect of this nuclear science. Was it pushed by the scientists themselves to governments uh, about the potential of a nuclear bomb? Or did the, did the politicians get wind of what the physicists were doing and, and push it? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite understand the... <coughs> so before the Second World War, when this um, nuclear science was being developed towards um, fission, um, was, it, was it largely scientists who realized the military potential of this and, and, and pushed it towards politicians? Uh, or was it the other way around? Uh, or was it a kind of balance of both? No, no, it, 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 was, uh, it was clearly the scientists, the, the physicists in this case, who first uh, realized the possibility or making a uranium bomb, and uh, I mean there was this famous memorandum by Einstein and Szilard and uh, Wigner, I think it was, to uh, President Roosevelt in 1940. Uh, they they uh, more or less uh, suggested that the U.S. should make this bomb because the Germans they thought was doing just that, and so it was very much the the the, the physicists. And it was only after Pearl Harbor that the American government uh, really started this project. Um, but it's also true that, that, that uh, by 1939, 1940, it was far from evident to the physicists that it would be, it could, that such a bomb could be constructed at all. Uh, for instance, Niels Bohr in uh, I think in late 1939, he gave an interview to a Danish newspaper and he said very clearly, oh yes, this is possible in principle and perhaps in 30 years it can be done. That was the, the, uh, the people considered it more or less in, impossible to, uh, to, uh, to separate the isotopes from in uranium. Thank you. Okay. So in, in the uh, centre here, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for a very good talk on big science. Um, I wonder if there's a parallel thread which I would perhaps call big engineering which grew up at the same time and probably as a very positive synergy in that how to manage extremely complex projects and do systems engineering which enabled the big science to work was perhaps equally important and one can chart a parallel development of the two and that might be interesting to explore. Oh yes, and uh, I mean it's, it's, it's not only parallel developments because big, uh, big technology, big engineering was part and parcel of the Manhattan Project. Uh, and not only, uh, um, not only the, the physics oriented uh, facilities but, but also very importantly uh, in chemistry where, uh, what is this called, uh, the big uh, American, uh, the big, big American chemical corporation which developed nylon. What is the name of that? DuPont, yes. The DuPont Corporation was centrally involved in the Manhattan Project and many of the other big American engineering corporations. So following on from the last question, to my surprise, because I was going to comment on your quote which you've got up there. I, so point of what, sorry? I was going to comment on the quote from Goldschmidt which is still on the screen. Yes. I, uh, yes. I agree with him okay. because what he says at the bottom, ultimately it's the machine that creates the particles. So you have to build the machine, you have to make it work, 
Everybody has to do their own little part of keeping it working and making it calibrated because if you, otherwise you don't get anything useful out and everybody's work is wasted. And there's that, that's a, a shift in how people do their work that I don't think is, even today, on a project that I've recently been on, it hasn't filtered down. And I think it's, it sort of goes back to, again, we know how to do things, big, en big engineering, the, the Apollo space program. The Apollo space program is very public. People know how people did it. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. There, there, there's a question in the third back row up there on, on your side. Thank you. A, a couple of questions ago you were asked about uh, pre-war, post-war, to what extent do you feel that the birth of modern particle physics in the 1950s was driven after the discovery of the pion by the fear that there might be even more dramatic sources of energy in the nucleus and we'd, get hold, we'd better get hold of them before they do. <laughs> the question was about uh, 1950s, high energy physics, and what about the pion, where did that...? The, the question whether, after the atomic bomb had been exploded okay. and revealed that we could access the energy of the nucleus, with the discovery of the pion, which is the agent that binds the nucleus, the possibility that there might be even more dramatic forms of energy, and that drove particle physics in the government's minds as a means to make sure that if there is something, we want to have it before the enemy do. Okay. I don't know, I don't really know. Uh, it's true, of course, that uh, the, the developments about 1950 opened up for uh, many, many new particles. Um, the pion itself was not discovered in an accelerator project, it was discovered in the cosmic uh, rays, and uh, until the mid-1950s or even the, about 1960, cosmic ray physics uh, was uh, as important a hunting ground for new particle as accelerator physics was. Um, uh, I'm afraid that's all I can say about it. Uh, thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Um, question about um, the Manhattan Project itself. As I understand it, there were two devices that were worked on a uranium and a plutonium based device. Uh, presumably they split the project into two elements because of they weren't sure which one was going to work or both. What were the thinking pros and cons before and pros and cons after between the two devices? Was it uh, what did they think initially about the comparison between the two? Yes. Uh, what, they, what conclusion did they come the, to? Well the, the people behind the Manhattan Project uh, were uncertain whether they would be able to create a bomb in time and so they adopted a dual strategy and worked on the plutonium uh, manufacturer at the same time as they worked on the uranium line and uh, um, but by the spring of 1945 it, they were convinced that they could produce both types of weapons uh, but the problem with uh, the plutonium bomb was that um, uh, the bomb itself could not be constructed in the same way as the u u u uranium bomb, so they had to find out uh, a new way of, of squeezing these subcritical um, masses of, of <coughs> plutonium, which they did, and that was basically the work of Edward Teller, who, who constructed, uh, well, the theory behind the so-called implosion, uh, where we have the, the, uh, the fissile uh, material and then it is it's pressured from all sides equally and, and, and so forth, which was a technically and even mathematically uh, a very complicated uh, problem, but, but they succeeded. Well, they succeeded is, yeah, the right word. But so it was more difficult to do with a plutonium bomb to shape the charge, the implosion. Uh, yes, in, in, the, in the uranium bomb, it, it was a little easier 
It has something to do with the uh, mean lifetime of, of the two isotopes, of course. Uh, so in, in the um, Hiroshima bomb, uh, it was uh, relatively simple. You had two subcritical masses and uh, a uranium-235, or at least enriched uranium, and you have a, 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 a classical explosive, and you smash them together, and when they become supercritical, go, it goes. Thank you. Uh, going back to uh, ethical issues and uh, 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 the question uh, that whether it was uh, uh, politicians or uh, uh, scientists driving towards uh, nuclear capable, uh, capabilities, it, it, it often strikes me that the uh, uh, scientists were quite naive uh, without knowing what they are producing. Is that also your impression that they really didn't have a good uh, understanding of what's coming up? So they drew towards uh, something that uh, they did not really bid in for, or were they uh, aware of what, they, what was coming up? In in in, in some cases, the uh, science, the physicists involved uh, in the Manhattan Project could well be described as politically naive. Uh, there is this famous quote, an authentic quote, uh, from uh, Oppenheimer, I think it was, but he, he said that, well, I, I know that the result of this is, is terrible and so forth, but uh, these scientific questions are so sweet. Uh, he, he, uh, he was fascinated by, by the science of it. and. Uh, uh, at least for a period that changed after the war, of course, uh, almost unable to, to, to think in the bigger uh, political framework, but, but uh, uh, it depends from pe person to person. Niels Bohr, of course, during the war, he, he was uh, very much aware of the political and ethical dimension, uh, but, but uh, he was atypical in that respect. Thank you. So Thank you very much for the questions. We'll just take one last question in, in this session and before we and move on. And this is just really an addition to what's being said here. I read a book called Brighter Than a Thousand Suns many, many decades ago. And um, in that, I believe, uh, after the testing of the uh, prototype bomb, should we say, um, uh, the moral thinking scientists asked General Groves, who was in charge of it on the political level, he was the link into the politics. Yeah. Um, if, he, if he thought it was going to be used, couldn't they stop it? And he, he basically was the ultimate realist and said, no way, this is going ahead now. Which is what he was going to be used. Yeah. And I think, he, you know, we're talking about the different attitudes of different groups in society. Groves was a, a, a practical realist and in touch with the political world. And the scientists maybe lived in a bit of a bubble as regards the idealism that they considered. Well, with that uh, comment there, I think, I think we can... Uh, no, no, just perhaps uh -huh. that uh, no. this book to which you referred, uh, Robert Jungs, uh, was the author. Uh, at the time it was published, it was by far the most detailed account, but it has been uh, very severely criticised. Um, in particular, because he, uh, when it came, came to the German uh, uranium project, he, um, uh, he portrayed Heisenberg as completely innocent. And uh, so, so uh, there, there are many much more uh, reliable and more critical accounts of, of this episode today. So with that, could we thank Helga again? Thank you.